on our website. And again, we greatly appreciate it and uh, thank you for your support in advance. Um, and tonight we are going to get started with this fantastic Q&A. So at this time, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Janelle Riley. Good evening, everyone. Um, as the nice lady told you, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm the film and TV editor of Backstage. I'm so thrilled to be here tonight for this SAG Foundation conversation with Kevin Bacon. Um, I knew this was a big one, not just by the amount of people who tweeted me and emailed me, but by the fact that my mom actually wanted to figure out how to work the live stream tonight. She has never watched me on one of these before, <laughs> and she is tuning in tonight. Um, <laughs> Since his movie debut in National Lampoon's Animal House, Kevin Bacon has become not only one of the best, but the most prolific actors of his or any generation. I literally do not ha have a time to list even a fraction of his credits, but the sampling includes Footloose, Mystic River, Apollo 13, and now we get to watch him every week on Fox TV's The Following. <laughs> So I was going to say give him a warm hand, you've already given him several, but let's do one more for Kevin Bacon. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Congratulations on not only a critically um, heralded show, but a, a hit in the ratings as well. It's a very rare combination. I don't read reviews, so I'm glad <laughs> that you're calling it a critical hit. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. You know, the other day, uh, my wife said to me, so we should just take this moment to say uh, it, is, it is what you want it to be, you know, and, and uh, we're, you know, so often I think we're all looking for the next thing, and you know, it's like you're constantly trying to uh, look look ahead and look forward and, and do better, and all these goals that you've set. You know, you, it's not that often that you stop and go, "Okay, that was good. That worked out. You know, that was that's been a good year." And you get to enjoy it in the middle of it, like you're recognizing yeah. it right now. Yeah. Well, we just actually wrapped about uh, five weeks ago, I think, something like that. So it's it's. Uh, it's, it's nice. I, I mean, the last two episodes are on one's on tonight, one's on next week, but uh, it, now I'm thinking I'm, I'm not in that headspace so much anymore, so it's good. And you're already picked up for a second season. We are, yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great. It's great. Yeah. Wait a second. If it's, it's airing tonight, why are you guys all here? I know, exactly. <laughs> well, you'll have time. If we pick this up, everyone will have time, depending on the traffic. <laughs> to make it home by 9 o'clock. And since the season finale airs next week, tell us everything that's going to happen. I will. I will. <laughs> you know, I made the mistake, uh, like, uh, I guess a week ago or two weeks ago, you know, with the whole Twitter thing, which I'm relatively new to. And somebody just had seen the show and tweeted a nice compliment about a plot twist, and I retweeted it. But I hadn't thought about the people that were DVRing, and I hadn't thought about Europe oh. and and South America. Oh. And boy, did I catch it, man! People <laughs> really, really pissed at me. And uh, so I learned I learned my lesson. So I'm. I'm <laughs> uh, we are going to come back to the following, but I actually want to start at the beginning of your career. Okay. Um, since this is a SAG audience, I always like to ask, how did you get your SAG card? My SAG card was pure nepotism. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, and, and it's, 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 it's kind of strange because I don't come from a theatrical family. Uh, nobody going back generations behind me was in any way involved with the theater. But I did have one cousin. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes, folks. <laughs> My cousin Timothy um, uh, had gone into... Um, uh, theater, and she was a director, and she was directing a children's workshop in Springfield, Massachusetts for the summer. Uh, I had just moved to New York, I guess. Um, I was probably 17 or 18, and uh, 
now that I'm telling this story, that was my equity card. Well, now it's the same. I'm sorry. Is it, isn't this the equity Q&A? Yeah. It's my all one card. and the same now. I have no idea how I got my SAG card. Uh, I guess because I did Animal House. Really? I think Animal House was my SAG card. It had to be because I didn't, uh, I, that was the first thing I'd ever done. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's a, that's a, <laughs> forget the last two minutes of your life. Um, uh, no, Animal House, I, w I was at Circle in the Square. I was at school at, there. I moved from Philadelphia uh, to, you know, I'd gotten out of high school. I was working in a warehouse for probably, I don't know, four or five months in, in Philly. And uh, I wanted to go to New York and just try to chase the dream. And uh, I literally was like suitcase and a dream on the train on the subway, 72nd and, and Broadway, got off and went, oh man, here I am, you know, this is the center of the universe, and, and uh, I was sleeping on my sister's couch. I started at Circle in the Square acting school, and um, they, the first year I was there, they sent a casting director over to the school, or, or he called up and said, we're looking for, um, you know, like preppy freshman type, college types, and they sent me over and I got that gig. And, oh. and that was, I think that was my side card. Yeah. How did your parents feel about you leaving home at 17 to move to New York? Well, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of six. And uh, by the time, I honestly, I don't think they noticed I was gone. <laughs> I mean, my parents were great and supportive and like incredibly supportive of what I did, but there was no resistance whatsoever, because I didn't even, we didn't even talk about going to college. That was not even in my, uh, that was not in the discussion that I had. It was, there was no part of them that said, you know, plus they were very, very just hands off mm -hmm. from everything that I did. I mean, to a fault, I think, sometimes. I'm, I'm much more, much, much more involved with my children than my parents were with me. So they said, fine, my father uh, gave me a little bit of money. It was something like, uh, somehow $4,000 sounds uh, like the number. And that's, you know, not nothing yeah. to, you know, sniff out. And that was to pay for the acting school, which I think was 2000 maybe for the first year or something like that or, or something like that. So uh, I had that, and I had my sister's couch. And um, <laughs> that, that was the beginning. And did you have to take survival jobs, or did you just hit the ground Oh, yeah, running? I was a waiter for, yeah, quite a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah, yeah. I got a waiting, my first gig was a, uh, a busboy at Fiorello's Roman Cafe on uh, six, about 63rd and, and Broadway. Uh, I, was, I was a terrible busboy. I mean, I, I, I had real, <clears throat> real disasters and, uh, <laughs> and I, I, they moved me up to waiter and uh, I, dropped, I dropped a bottle of, a, a bottle of ketchup onto, uh, it broke, and it went all of this guy was wearing a white suit. Oh. <laughs> Literally my first, my first day as a waiter. Oh. And, um, and I, I thought to myself, there were t the two hamburgers on the plate and the bottle of ketchup. You had to serve everything on a, on a tray. That was the tray service. That was their deal, you know, because it was classier. <laughs> 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 and uh, the ketchup hit the floor, it hit the guy's suit. Oh. And I thought, well, shit, I gotta put these two hamburgers down before I deal with it. <laughs> so I just walked away from the guy. <laughs> and my, uh, you know, he went nuts. He went yeah. absolutely ballistic. And the amazing thing was, I'll never forget this, the guy, Phil Scott, I still remember the guy's name. He was the manager of, of the restaurant. And he didn't say anything to me. And I was like, holy shit. And he was a terrifying dude. I mean, it's like really a tough manager. Everybody was scared of him. And I was like, how come he's not saying anything? This is real, this is almost worse. And he called me down to the um, to this little basement at the end of the day shift, and he said, "You know, you're not ready to be a, a waiter, right?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, yeah, Phil, I know, I know, I know." Yeah. <laughs> and so he kind of cut my shift back or whatever. But what? But I ended up working. Actually, a buddy of mine is here that I went to acting school with. But he he in indirectly got me a job at a place called the Allstate Cafe, which was on Seventy Second between uh, West End and Broadway. And I ended up working there for, I don't know, for, off and on for probably three years. I, every time I would make enough money that I thought I didn't have to 
have this waiting job anymore. I would leave, and then <laughs> I would spend the money, and I'd have to go back and ask my boss, ask my boss for the, yeah. When Animal House came out, I had to ask for uh, the night off to go to the premiere. You're kidding, no. you had gone back to work there? Oh yeah, yeah, and many, a couple years after Animal House too. Well, I have to ask about Animal House because it was filmed at my alma mater, uh -huh. University of Oregon. Right. Uh, what was the process like of, of landing? Well, you know why role? it was there, by the way, was because it's supposed to be a East Coast kind of, I think it was based on like Dartmouth or, you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. Nobody would touch it on the East Coast. Nobody would let, <laughs> a, a, you know, anybody. And they were like, and I only found out this out later, you know, they were kind of going around and saying, well, you know, where are we going to shoot this movie? Because it's like we can't, we need like, Ivy walls of a campus, you know, but it's all about, you know, whatever, you know, tits and ass and whatever, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know and and uh, they ended up writing a different version of the script, I think, and they took all the objectionable stuff out and finally got the University of Oregon uh, to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to be suckered in to uh, <laughs> uh, letting the movie shoot up there. So. Yeah, it was nuts, man. I mean, uh, I was nuts. I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't know. I, th I didn't have an agent. I didn't have any kind of real idea about the business at all. And um, I went for this first au audition. There wasn't that much to say. I mean, I don't have that many lines in the movie, so I guess I said what I said. Was it, thank you, sir, may I have another? I don't know if I might have said that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That was like my only line. And uh, uh, the, the, guy, the guy said, uh, John Landis was the director, and he said, so look smarmy. Like, make, make, make look smarmy face. And I, honestly, I, I had no idea what that word meant. <laughs> it wasn't in my vocabulary. But I figured it was, had a little bit of an onomatopoeia kind of thing, so I kind of made the you know, face that I thought sounded, you know, smart. He's like, ah, ha, ha, so smart. So the, nec the next time I went back, he did the same thing. Just make that face again, you know. And, and, uh, and then the guy called me up, literally, and said, you got the movie. And I said, okay, that's awesome, man. And he goes, uh, you're getting scale. And I was like, great. Not only did I not know what what, how much scale was? I didn't know what it meant. I thought he meant there'll be a scale in your room. I, 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 I really, I, I, I had no idea. And then I, I knew that there was a plan. If I remember correctly, this is a long time ago, so I, I mean, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, it's been a lot of road between me and this story. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, I was planning on leaving on a Monday and they called me up maybe on a Thursday or something like that and said, as it turns out, we're going to shoot your scene earlier than we thought, and we need you out here as soon as possible. You have to get on a plane, like, tomorrow morning. And I said, I, can't, I got a date. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and by the way, I just dropped my laundry off, and it's, it's, still, in the, it's still in the laundry room. The guy, the, the, it's, it, they're definitely not going to have it. It's a fluff and fold, and they won't have it. So, I mean, I remember that part of it. Uh, and he's like, no, schmuck, uh, you don't understand. Well, you have to be uh, at the airport and on this plane. So uh, I said, oh, OK, OK. So I didn't get my laundry back. I left it there. I packed what other, the other stuff that I had. I went to the airport. I got on the plane. It's the first time I'd ever flown first class. And can I tell you, the idea that the alcohol was free, <laughs> that blew my mind. <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, uh, really? You, I don't have to pay for this? I was only 18. I was going to say, yeah. I, was yeah. 18. <laughs> I, I could not believe that I didn't have to pay for it. So I started drinking. <laughs> yeah. I was going to spend the night in um, uh, San Francisco because I had to get up to Oregon and th th I guess there was no flight or I was going to have to spend the night in a hotel in San Francisco and then fly first thing in the morning to Oregon to be on the set that day, that next day, to shoot the scene. And the more I drank, the more I thought the fact that I was a movie star <laughs> Probably meant that 
the flight attendant would be spending the night with me. <laughs> and so I started flashing my script. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just pathetic. 18 years old. <laughs> you know, hitting on like 30-year-old you know, flight attendant, flashing my script. I mean, it had no, you know, and I finally, you know, I, I said, you know, listen, I'm in, or I'm in San Francisco just for the night. She said, nice try. Uh, and she said to me, um, back in those days, this is hard to remember, but in first class, a lot of times, and this has happened to me subsequently, as you were leaving the plane, if you'd been really nice, they would actually give you a bottle of whatever they had really? left. Really? Yeah. So I ended up, towards the end of my meal, this is back when they would also serve after dinner drinks. <laughs> I thought that uh, a sophisticated after dinner drink would be amaretto. <laughs> I think I'd probably seen the commercial for it or something like that. I, it's the most disgusting shit. I, I, to this day, I can't even look at a bottle of amaretto. And she gave me the rest of the bottle of amaretto to take with me. So I, and so I put my tail between my legs, took my script, and went to this you know, hotel and, and spent the night and then Cracking off dawn with a hangover, you know, got up. Went to uh, Oregon. They rushed me. I had really long hair, by the way. And, oh, really? Yeah. And, and uh, they rushed me into the makeup uh, hair thing and, zzz, 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 you know, cut my hair off. I was like, oh, huh, wow, that's awful. <laughs> and then uh, tried to get me fitted for my costume, my wardrobe. Um, and uh, n they had called me to ask me what my sizes were. I didn't know my sizes. I mean, I, that, that wasn't something that uh, I knew. I would just like put on my clothes. I, I, I didn't know what my weight, you know, like my inseam. My, what's my, I, I had no idea. So uh, and nothing fit. And I remember the wardrobe uh, uh, designer being like furious at me. You know, and we're gonna have to you know, remake everything and tail. And she was all, all pissed off at me. Uh, and then I sat there in, in uh, whatever kind of dressing room it was, maybe like a little, you know, like a honey wagon, um, and uh, didn't work that day. And then I didn't work for, I don't know, a week or something. And it was such a great education because it was like, I know that you've all been in that situation where you get so amped up for that moment, you know, you're there and you're on a set and here it comes and, you know, blah, blah, and it's like, it doesn't happen. And you feel like you've just shot your wad of, you know, and, and uh, I, 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 it was a great lesson. I sat there in the rain, it was rained, I, you know, and I sat there in a the hotel, and, you know, for a week alone. And, you know, in was, Oregon. In which, Oregon, yeah. yeah. It, was rain, it was raining a lot. <laughs> but it was a great experience. Did you think that it would open doors for you? Or were you kind of surprised that you had to go back to waiting tables? I don't think, yeah, I thought that it would, and yeah. it, it didn't, you know. I mean, I, yeah, I thought it would. I thought, sure I did. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know. Um, did you have, did you get an agent off of it at least? Um, no, I got an agent uh, off of a um, uh, a workshop that I did. I went back to New York. I I went to the uh, Equity Lounge. They had an Equity Lounge. In the Equity Lounge was a uh, billboard that had open calls for showcases. And a lot of times you were kind of like, well, a showcase is it? I don't know. People would say to me. Don't do a showcase. It's, it's worthless. <laughs> and uh, uh, I did a showcase, and you know, an agent saw me and oh. got an agent out of that. And did that? Uh, did you find other roles started coming your way once you had representation? It got better. Yeah, yeah. it got better. I was doing um, a lot of theater. I was doing. I did a couple of little things where, like, a movie would come into town and they'd need day players. You know, so I did a couple of little like one day or two day things and um, and uh, and then eventually I got on to soap operas. Right, which I know you did, um, I believe, I know you did One Life to Live, but Search for Tomorrow? Uh, I did Search for Tomorrow and The Guiding, Guiding Light. Light. One Life to Live, I was working as an extra, yeah. Now I've heard from so many actors that that is a great training ground um, for being in front of the camera. Was, was that your experience? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, It was a great training ground for professionalism, you know, but I don't think that I was really lacking in that. But in terms of like 
being there on time, getting a schedule, making that your priority, learning your lines, uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great training ground. In terms of the actual work, honestly, I felt like it was, the material was so awful <laughs> that, that it, was, it was constantly a, a struggle to try to um, infuse it with some kind of, you know, I was so serious about mm -hmm. it. And, and, and I was surrounded by people who had been doing, you know, such sort of crap <laughs> for so long that they were, they didn't give a shit anymore. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, to me, I'm not saying for everybody, to me, that was toxic, you know. Is that why you got out, or did yeah. you did another opportunity present itself? No, no, no. Really? There was no opportunity. No, when I when I <laughs> <laughs> no, I left after a year. I'd done search for tomorrow for nine weeks. I did guiding light for a year. After a year, I had I had not, you know, again, you know, this was just youth. You know, I had no concept of saving my mm -hmm. money. You know, and and. Uh, even though my overhead was like nothing, uh, I had a way of going through whatever money I would make from, from the soaps. And um, so the contract was up, and uh, they offered me a, a, you know, an extension. I think they wanted two more years or something like that. And I looked around, and I had nothing. I had no auditions. I had uh, really nothing to go to. But I just... My instinct just said, I, I gotta, I gotta say goodbye to this, this particular thing, this world. Wow. And I believe shortly thereafter, you won your first Obie Award. I say first because I assume there are others on the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> For the Slab Boys, opposite Sean Penn. Mm-hmm. Um, which you've who you've gone on to work with Sean since then. Sure. But at that time, I mean, could you tell that that he was this iconic actor in the making? He was great. Yeah, uh, he was great. Um, he was, uh, you know, he was fantastic. We had a great time doing the show. It was a, it was a show that I had done actually at, at Actors Theater of Louisville earlier, uh, which was a great, it was the first time that it, it had been um, done in the States, came from Scotland, and somebody had picked it up to move it. That was actually Broadway. I don't know that I, I don't know if the Obie was actually for, the, for that because it, I think, I, th I have a feeling that Slab Boys was on Broadway, but I could be wrong. Anyway, uh, we, yeah, Val Kilmer was in the show, and Jackie Earl Haley, wow. and Brian Ben Ben, and it was great. It was a, it was a, it was great, and Sean was fantastic. Wait, just so we're clear, you're not sure which which show you won your Obie Award for? No, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really not. But I, I, I don't think it was Slap Boys because it, because I think Slap Boys was tech. Obie is like a off Broadway, off -Broadway. award, and yeah. I think that Slap Boys. I think I, I think Obie might have been uh, a play I did called Forty Deuce which was about um, uh, I, uh, it was a gay hustler, uh, kind of junkie hustler. I think you're right, actually. And also around this time, you booked what really became um, your big breakthrough role, I think, in Diner, directed by Barry Levinson. This yeah. had every young, great actor in the cast, you sure. and Daniel Stern and Ellen Barkin and Steve Gutenberg. <clears throat> uh, I'm curious about the casting process. And also, was it always the role of Timothy that you went after? No, Diner was was one of those things that came around, and and you know how it is when you, when uh, something sort of happens and you start to hear about it and you start to know that the people that you're in a sort of well, uh, your your colleagues that are around the same age and everybody's kind of up for it, and they start talking about it, and uh, they did a really like pretty extensive search to put that cast together, and there was no uh, thinking at all amongst Barry and, and, and uh, Mark Johnson, the producer, about finding names. You know, so often, uh, boy, these days, and I guess it was still true to a certain extent back there, but, but it's all about the names, you know, it's all about putting the, together names and how, what does somebody mean, you know, overseas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when in, the, in the case of Diner, it was really like, okay, let's just find the, well, let's put together the best like five or six guys that we could find. So they, they were testing 
uh, guys in LA, and they were testing guys uh, in New York or auditioning. Um, and I guess I read the whole script, and I went, well, I think the best part is either uh, uh, the part that Tim Daly played, because he was kind of romantic and was getting the girls, and I liked that part of it. <laughs> and, uh, or the pl part that Mickey played, because he was kind of cool and tough and, you know, whatever, you know, whatever Mickey did with it. And I didn't really see the part of Fenwick on the page as being something that either I would be good at or, or really was all that interested in. And so I went in and I auditioned for both of those other parts because you get to choose. That's what it was. Yeah, you got to choose. If you made, your, if you made it to the audition, you got to choose which, ones, which guy you wanted to take a shot at. So I took a shot at those two. Uh, and Barry said, no, 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 go to Fenwick. Try to... So uh, I, I went back out, uh, really, like, not even really knowing. I hadn't worked on Fenwick. I hadn't thought about Fenwick really all that much because I, I was so sure that it was, I was more right for the other two. Came back in and then got a call back. And, and the call back was like a real full-on screen test. I mean, they had a diner set. They had uh, uh, real cameras, not video cameras, like you know, like 35 millimeter cameras. Full crew, uh, uh, all these guys, 20, 30 guys that they were going to mix and match and put into different groups and, and sort of you know put them all, play them all together. And I had unbelievable flu. I mean, oh. 104 literally on the day that I went to that audition. I was so sick. And uh, part of what, you know, serendipitously, that character at least was based on was just going, I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and uh, they, they liked it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Did you have to get method and give yourself the flu for the whole shoot? <laughs> I don't know how you do that. <laughs> Did you find, did Diner change things for you? Were you able to quit the waiting job? I did, yeah. I mean, <laughs> by, by the time Diner came out, I, I had stopped waiting tables. I don't remember the exact moment when I was able to stop or when I felt like I was, you know, I had enough money in the bank to stop. But, but yeah, it, it, I, I stopped waiting tables, but, I, but it didn't really, it didn't really change things that much. It didn't seem like that big a deal. I'll tell you why, because Diner, was this unbelievable kind of critical success. Yeah. But it wasn't like a big movie. I mean, it's, it's, it's found its life, you know, through the years on, on um, you know, with people watching it on, 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 well, back then it was VHS, but, you know, <laughs> uh, Laserdisc. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it wasn't like, ba-boom, oh, here it comes, you know. I remember uh, going to the premiere of Diner I was really disappointed. I had heard that it was good, but the first time I saw it was the premiere. Um, I was like, wow, it's so dark. And like, can you really tell the difference between any of the characters? <laughs> I mean, I really, I, it was a great lesson in, in, in how my own perception of things that I'm in is, yeah. is, is just totally, totally skewed. And I thought, you know, see, Diner was positioned um, as, like Porky's, like that's the way that it was sold to the studio, Animal House, right? Exactly. But a couple years after. So I thought it was gonna be this giant, giant kind of commercial, woo hoo hoo, hey, da, 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 you know, kind of, <laughs> and it would make a lot of money, you know what I mean? And then I saw this like really intense, kind of dark, funny, quirky, uh, sort of movie, which of course, in, in now I love. I think it's a, I think it's an amazing movie. But at the time, it's not what I had sort of signed up for in a yeah. way. And uh, and I remember, I'll never forget. I'm, I go to the bathroom after the, after the screening, and I'm standing at the urinal. And uh, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 nice it's, space work. Yeah. It's instinct. It's just instinct and uh, uh, reflex. And this guy goes, hey, you were in that movie, right? I go, yeah, he goes, it was a sleeper. I slept. <laughs> oh. 
I said, okay, this is the way people were, you know, be responding to the movie. Yeah. And luckily, critics kind of got behind it and nurtured it, and it, you know, found its own life. But did it change my life? No. In fact, what I found was that uh, I was auditioning now, um, but I was auditioning for the quirky, weird, next door neighbor, mm -hmm. or friend, you know, uh, you know, the sort of, the, in a weird way, I, it, it was like I was auditioning to, to, for character parts, which is what I had been doing on the stage in Slab Boys and in uh, 40 Deuce and other plays that I'd done, it, but all these kind of like character parts. But I really wanted to be a leading man. And that diner didn't, uh, didn't push that, you know, for me. But you followed that with Footloose, where you got to be a leading man, right. you got to get the girl. Um, <laughs> I have to imagine. And then I said, and then I was like, I don't want to be a leading man, I want to be a character actor. <laughs> of course. I don't know, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> Did you know when, when you got the script for Footloose that you were on to something special? Or did you just think, I mean, I remember when I heard the plot for it, I was like, that's silly, a town where dancing is outlawed. Yeah. And then you see it, and it's, it's I mean, I'm, don't use this word lightly, but it's a classic. Thank you. Um, I, no, I didn't know I was on to something. I mean, for one thing, uh, I had no indication from the script that it was a dance movie. It didn't. <laughs> the title didn't. No, it didn't, they didn't really indicate that. I mean, honestly, it said, uh, you know, whatever. The guy goes in, and he's pissed off, and he takes a sip of a beer, and then he dances. But, you know, it didn't say, like, he'll be swinging from the rafters and throwing something. You know what I mean? There was nothing. Yeah. There was no indication of that. I, I didn't. And, and I, remember talking, they, I remember talking to them and saying, uh, um, you know, they said something about a choreographer. In fact, there was a choreographer. And part of the first part of the audition was that we had to go uh, and have like a, a you know choreography dance thing. I remember saying to them, I, I mean, well, I'm happy to do it, yeah, but you know, just so you know, I mean, I can dance. I go out dancing all the time. <laughs> but, you know, just put on, you know, not, not that big a thing, really. I mean, I, and I got to. California, where we were going to rehearse uh, the, 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 the thing for, I don't know, two weeks or three weeks of rehearsal. First said that blew my mind. I was like, really? Our mind? I mean, it's like a long time for rehearsal. And uh, we're going to go to uh, Oregon. Again? No, uh, not Oregon. <laughs> yeah. no, uh, no. Another state. No, uh, I know. It was uh, uh, Utah. We shot in Utah, in uh, Provo, Utah. And, and, uh, I walked on to, it was at Paramount, I walked on to the, this soundstage, and I was all by myself and this choreographer, and there was an entire wall of mirrors, and a dance bar, and rings, and mats, and vaulting equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked around, and I went, holy shit. <laughs> this is, a, I, I, I had no idea. I had no idea that that's what they were going for. Wow. So, uh, was it strange for you when they remade Footloose a couple years ago? Did you see the movie? Yeah, I saw it. Uh, but, no, it wasn't strange. Uh, I liked it. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I went. Uh, I was. I was shooting up in in Boston. I was shooting a movie called R.I.P.D. up in Boston, and it came out. And I, you know, walked up the street and saw it. And I thought that they did a really good job. I think that the. Uh, I really liked the. Uh, the director of the movie, I'd been wanting to work with him. Um, th I think the, the, the biggest difference that I saw in the two movies, speaking of which, was that the, the actors that they cast in, in, the, in the remake were fantastic dancers. Mm. None of us were dancers in that <laughs> sense of the, and, 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 and as a result, I had to be doubled, you know, quite a bit. I mean, the, a lot of the stuff I did, but I was, all, I was doubled through a lot of it. Um, uh, Chris, Chris Penn, not a dancer, you know. Uh, great, great actor, wonderful guy, you know, fantastic in the movie, and, and the process of watching him, you know, kind of yeah. start to dance was one of the most brilliant things in it, it was, was him, you know. But not, but not a dancer. Um, 
and and that 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 I think was what was different. So, so like when to, to see the remake, it was it was amazing because I was like, boy, these these kids can fucking dance. <laughs> <laughs> did they hit you up to do a cameo or anything? They did. <laughs> but that didn't interest you, or uh, I didn't. I mean, it interested me, but I it, it didn't. I felt like it was going to not. It wasn't going to help the movie, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't that great a part. I mean, that's really what it was. I bet this, it was a cameo, but it was it's not a good part. Yeah. Um, I have to imagine that the success of Footloose, coupled with the critical success of Diner, really put you on Hollywood's radar at that point. And uh, I'm imagining that you sort of had your choice of roles. Um, how did you make your choices? What? How did you decide which roles you would take? I don't know. I mean, I think that, that I look at that time afterwards as sort of like a quite a few years of sort of a slide down the mountain really? because Footloose was really you know like such a success and everything from that point on uh, in terms of the leads that I was doing were just not working and I think there was a part of me honestly that wasn't quite ready or comfortable or, or whatever with with the amount of celebrity and fame and, and as much as it was what I always dreamed of as a child because it really was I mean I really really wanted when I was a little boy I really wanted to be famous really? you know and I was gonna get it you know but when I got it I don't know I didn't it just didn't quite feel right I think because I I had an I my 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 energy had shifted from you know being like a superstar, you know, like David Cassidy or Bobby Sherman or something. <laughs> my, my energy had shifted to being like a serious actor. Mm -hmm. And when Footloose came out, I was such a pop star. So now I thought to myself, well, how can I get, how can I take this and turn it into being a serious actor? And the, the choices that I made from that point on uh, were, you know, just not good. For There's a some good time. movies in there, though. The, well, I mean, good and you know, good move, doing good movies and doing the difference between good movies and movies that people see. You know, those are the, the, those aren't always, they don't always line up. You know. Well, um, she's having a baby is one of my good favorites. Good movie. Yeah. Very proud of that movie. No, nobody went. <laughs> you know? No, honestly, that was really? a yeah. I'm very very proud of that movie. In fact, uh, that's a that's an interesting story because John Hughes uh, is a fantastic. Um, director, I loved his films, and uh, was, you know, fought really hard to to get that movie. And I remember the process of, of going through getting it was long and, and sort of arduous. And when I finally got it, we we went in and had this just incredible lining up of the where my life was at and his life was at, and and this kind of symbiosis because I was really playing him. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I really spent a tremendous amount of time with him and, 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 and his family and, and our lives just got completely, you know, kind of intertwined. And he loved the movie, and I loved the movie. And um, what happened was he had been so hugely successful, like everything that he did was just a giant, giant success. And I think that people were kind of gunning for him in that mm -hmm. weird thing that happens in, in Hollywood. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like it was time for him to uh, fail. And, you know, the movie came out. Um, nobody went. He was absolutely heartbroken mm -hmm. because it was the, the most personal thing that he had done. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, he actually did Planes, Trains, and Automobiles afterwards, which was a great movie, um, but wasn't quite all as much, you know. He used a lot of himself in his, his work all the time, but, but it was a little bit more about those guys mm -hmm. in a way, you know. Um, so anyway, it was, you know, another, you know, like I said, I'm not, I'm not it wasn't a question of, of whether or not the work was any good or the films were good. Sometimes they were bad, but, but uh, it was just a, a time when... It, Things weren't working. Wasn't Flatliners a big hit? Uh, I guess Flatliners did okay. 
<laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. I think it did okay. I love that movie. So, yeah. I think they're supposed to be remaking it. They're remaking all my movies that begin with F. <laughs> Hopefully they'll get to the D soon. Yeah. What about JFK? Does that count? Yeah, or few good men. <laughs> it does seem like by the early 90s you were taking more character-driven roles, or maybe I should say supporting roles in character-driven stories, like JFK, Murder on the First, River Wild. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious choice on your part, or was it just the roles that interested you? It was a, uh, a uh, you know, rarely do you look, I, I, I think of careers as, uh, you know, as kind of having, you know, they, they just sort of roll along as opposed to, well, it was at that moment that I did the, you know, it's very rare that you have those kinds of things. You hear about them a lot in books, but I think a lot of it's bullshit. I mean, I think you, I think you just kind of, you know, you just kind of go day after day. You try to put one foot in front of the other, and it's all baby steps, really, you know. But that particular thing, JFK, was a definite moment. It was a, uh, a real fork in the road. And... Um, it was a it was an agent that I had um, who said I, I, I think I, I see a different way for you to go. Uh, I remember her name was Paula Wagner. Oh wow! Uh, so I, I remember uh, that when I would look at your work uh, in the late seventies in New York on the stage, it was more character, it was edgier, it was, you know, just these sort of, I don't know, just uh, off left of center sort of parts that you were playing. I think we need to uh, try to go there. We need to forget about the size of your part, and we need to forget about the size of your salary, and we need to just kind of try something new. And she also represented Oliver Stone. And, and so she sent me in on, on um, JFK. And honestly, that was the, I really, uh, that really was a turning point. Mm -hmm. That was a real fork in the road. Had she been your agent for a while, or had you just? Yeah, yeah she had been for, for some time, yeah. Uh, and you were in period in all these ensembles. Uh, and around this time, I guess it was 1994, was when four college students created the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Mm -hmm. Um, I, like, does it baffle you how huge this thing has become? Uh, I mean, there's a board game, there's a book. Right. There's... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I guess what baffles me is, that it, is the hang time that it's had, you know? Yeah. Um, I wish that I had, you know, more interesting answer to it. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, heard that I created sixdegrees.org. You know that's been that's been a really positive thing that's come out of it for me. It's it's a charitable website. We've raised a lot of money and and uh, uh, but you know uh, it's I guess if I it, I would be irritated by it if there was another actor. You know, <laughs> if like every time I had to hear about six degrees of Kevin Costner, Kevin Spacey, Kevin yeah. Kevin Klein, you know what I mean? I, I think it would start to bug me, but. I, you know, it, now, now it doesn't bug me yeah. anymore. Well, and you've, you've sort of embraced it. I mean, you did the uh, commercial, the, one of my favorite commercials of all time, where you, where you play on the, the six degrees. Mm -hmm. um, it's just brilliant. Um, but it, yeah, it must be strange. And do you have people who, like, when they work with you, they're excited because their bacon number has decreased? <laughs> oh I think, well, I mean, you're two. Okay. You're a one? Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that he was really cop to that. You know, like, yeah. first day of work. Yeah. Nice to meet you. You know. Yeah. I'm so glad I'm on you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's cool. Yeah, you know, look, it's, it's, it's great. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I like to think about the idea that if you take me out of it, it really is a true concept, yeah. and that is that we are all connected. It's not just, you know, obviously it's not just me, but, you know, there's connections that happen uh, in, in our world of, of actors, of, uh, you know, how often do you go and either be at an audition or on the set or someplace and you run into somebody that knows somebody that worked with somebody that you knew. I mean, that's like that, that's what makes us feel 
when we have such a uh, competitive business, you know, to find ways that we can feel, a, you know, like a family, you know, that I think that that's a great feeling. It has, you know, very little to do with me, but just, just that, that connection. And also, you know, globally, just the idea that the things that people do on the other side of the world affect things that we do in our neighborhoods and vice versa, that we're all kind of riding on this rock, you know, and, uh, and we need to, you know, uh, think about what we do and take care of each other, basically. You know, that's to me what it is. Um, also in the 1990s, you stepped behind the camera. Uh, first, I believe, was uh, Losing Chase. Yeah. Was the first movie you directed. Was this something you'd always wanted to do? And, and why did you take the leap with that particular project? Well, I think that you get to the, a, a certain point where you, um, well, I'm not, you, you've been working for the man for so long, and you've been putting yourself into the hands of people who will shoot it the way they want it, edit it the way they want it, um, put the words in your mouth, put the clothes on your face, put the makeup on your, you know, it's, put, no, put the clothes on your body, put the makeup on your face. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's like you, you, you do that for so long and then you kind of go, well, maybe I could be the, the guy that's, that's, you know, telling that story. Uh, and that's really what it's about, is, is, is storytelling. So, so this thing kind of fell into our laps. We did it for Showtime, Kira was in it. It was something that she uh, had, connected to and had found and produced, and Helen Mirren was in it. Um, Helen Mirren got a glo Golden Globe for it. I was very happy and very proud of her. And um, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that, you know, you, it was a, a night shoot, and uh, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. The sun was coming up, and we'd wrapped, and I'd been in this situation a bazillion times before as an actor, and here comes the sun, and we finally got it, and we wrapped. And I go into, I didn't have a dressing room, obviously I go into Kira's dressing room, she, she wasn't in the shot, and uh, I take off my, my shoes, and then I take off my shirt, and I take off my pants, and I realize, wait a second, these are my own clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to change. I'm the director. <laughs> it was a real, it was a great moment. <laughs> so Kira starred in that, and you've also directed her in, I think, four episodes? Four episodes of Closer, closer yeah. And then we also did a, uh, a film called uh, Lover Boy. So next time I direct, she's got to not be in it. That's all I know. <laughs> sure well, what's it like to get to boss your significant other around in the workplace? Well, that's assuming that that's the relationship between this particular actress and director, <laughs> which is not necessarily the case. I mean, you know, especially on The Closer, I mean, you know, uh, if, in, in series television, you know, the, 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 it's, a, it's a machine that's already operating, and the director that comes into that, to that already operating machine really has to fit within that framework. Um, Kira's voice, uh, on that show is way more important than any director that would come in. So it really is not a question of bossing her around. Um, and I don't really look at directing, you know, uh, or at least my process of being a director as, as one of bossing around. I mean, I, I, th I think that, you know, the one thing that I've learned of being on the other, being on, on that side of the camera as an actor is that actors, actors for the most part, do their shit at home and they come in and they have ideas and oftentimes they're good, their instincts are right. They've spent so much more time focusing on those three lines <laughs> than, than a director could ever do with all yeah. the other shit that's on your plate, you know, between like the budget and the cameras and the, you know, what kind of gear you're gonna use and, and schedule and all those kinds of things. You haven't really been thinking with that kind of, you know, focus on those three lines. So, so the best thing you can do as a director is, is trust that, you know, probably if you've cast that part right, they're going to come in with something that's going to be of value. And rarely have I been in a situation where I've uh, thought to myself I had to, uh, you know, boss somebody around. Yeah. Um, you've been in big budget blockbusters. You've been in small independent films. Um, are there any films you wish had reached a wider audience? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't go into it hoping that only members of my immediate family go. <laughs> <laughs> like that's never been <laughs> that's never been high on my uh, 
<laughs> wish list. So, and, by the, and at the point where, where I uh, commit, um, I'm in all the way, and, I, and I, I want desperately for it to be seen. Uh, that's not always the case. I think probably I would say the film that, you know, I think probably The Woodsman, yeah. Murder in the First, those were two that were, that I wished had sort of found a, a, a bigger audience. You know, on one hand, on the other hand, Look, you know, one is a guy locked up and you know, at being beaten in Alcatraz, and the other is a pedophile. I mean, what, what am I thinking? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's it's not. Uh, I'm trying to think of a successful movie, not Star Wars. You know, I mean, it's you know, it's it's, it's you can't you can't really expect that with those that kind of subject matter. One that I actually think is an excellent movie is Stir of Echoes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually think it would have done better had it not come out after The Sixth Sense. Right. Um, but that is a fantastic movie. It feels like it's found a second life on DVD. Mm -hmm. um, I have to imagine people must bring that one up all the time. They do. They do. They always have a hard time with the uh, title because I, th <laughs> I think it was not a good title. I mean, uh, but I think that, yeah, we were really proud of that movie. I, um, and we were aware of The Sixth Sense. And... Uh, really uh, begged the distributor to put put it out before the Sixth Sense because there was a good buzz around the Sixth Sense and there was a real sense that sense there was a real feeling that it was going to be big and I am absolutely certain that it would have been huge regardless of whether Stir of Echoes had came up, come out first or not but for whatever reason it's like one of those kind of things with marketing and placement and in general, you know, people that have those kinds of, you know, gigs at, at studios or distributors or whatever, they don't, they usually are not really interested in the opinion of, you know, actor boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so Sixth Sense came out, it was a massive hit, Sir Beckles came out, it was like, well, it's, it's kind of like Sixth Sense and, you know. There's such different movies though, that's the strange thing. They are, but, you know, a little kid says, I see dead people or something. <laughs> I don't know if he says that in our movie, but it's kind of similar. <laughs> and you mentioned The Woodsman, which is an, an excellent movie, which you play a pedophile who gets out of prison after, I think, 12 years. Um, very um, brave subject matter, especially at the time, because I think it came out about 10 years ago. Were you at all wary about taking on that role? Mm, no. I wasn't. Uh, I mean, I wasn't wary to the extent that... Um, I thought, well, it's going to kill my career, you know. I mean, I mean, I'd, I'd already done a movie, Sleepers, where I was abusing mm -hmm. young boys in a pretty serious kind of way, and, and uh, I don't, I don't have fear of of portraying any piece of the human condition. There's nothing that scares me when it comes to the acting part of it. You know what I mean? I, it's like to to try to um, build an image of who I am uh, off screen or what I mean I think that ship kind of sailed a long time ago so I don't I don't I don't think about that uh, I was I was I was a, I, I guess I was afraid that I was going to um, I was afraid of actually what sort of happened and that was that I was going to go into this place and I knew that it would be difficult, and I knew that it would be um, challenging. And then there was n it was not going to find a you know find a, a life and mm -hmm. find a, a, a an audience. And I think that I probably, to a certain extent, underestimated how really truly difficult that you know subject matter is. And a lot of people have said to me, especially parents, you know. Dude, I heard that movie was good, but I just couldn't push play. You know, I, 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 I just, you know, let alone go to the theater to see mm -hmm. it. You know, and I, I get it. What would you say has been your most difficult role? Uh, well, you know, th th things are difficult in different different kinds of ways. I mean, uh, certainly The Woodsman was hard. Murder the First was was a very very difficult role um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, 
physically and um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, Hollow Man was very, very hard because I was, for so much of the movie, I was uh, painted green mm. because I was the green screen. Yeah. And I wore these giant green contacts and green teeth. And it was hours and hours in the makeup trailer, which I really don't do well. Um, I actually kicked the door off the trailer one day. <laughs> and uh, I'm embarrassed to say. And, uh, uh, you know, other stuff. I mean, there, for a lot of the movie, I had this latex mask that had to be glued onto my face, and I could only drink out of a straw. Wham, 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 the world's smallest violin. <laughs> <laughs> it also went on and on yeah. and on. And so it was, it, was, it was physically, like, really, really challenging. Um, talking about directing episodes of The Closer, in recent years, you've started dabbling in television. Um, I know you played yourself, or a, a version of yourself, on Will and Grace. Yeah. Um, and in 2009, you starred in the very acclaimed TV movie, Taking Chance. That's right. Yeah. For which you won a Golden Globe Award and a Screen Actors Guild Award, I believe. Um, did this, uh, what attracted you to that project? And did the experience make you interested in trying more television? I didn't really look at it as trying television in a strange kind of way because it was a, I looked at it more as a film. It was an HBO film, and, and um, it kind of looked like a film and read like a film and shot like a film, so it wasn't exactly like uh, trying television. Uh, that, that one, uh, I just was blown away by that, that script and that story, and I just said, wow, I had no idea that, uh, it, for those of you who don't know, it's about, about the, uh, uh, when, when soldiers are, are killed overseas, there's a, a process of returning the remains uh, they arrive at uh, uh, in, in Dover uh, Air Force Base and returning the remains to the to their final resting place. And it was a a, a, a real um, Marine who uh, volunteered for this what they call escort service, and then just wrote this kind of report about it. And it got picked up by the San Francisco Chronicle and turned into this this really beautiful script. Very very simple kind of story, but. Really, a story about sacrifice and about um, uh, the military and and, uh, and 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 the loss of life and all those kinds of things. Uh, it just really moved me when I when I read it, and I just went, well, I just I just didn't know that this went on, and that's really been the response that a lot of people had to it. So, so uh, yeah, I did it. Um, but it wasn't really my my way into television. I think my way into television had a little bit more to do with the closer and with seeing Kira's experience and you know experiencing that for seven years really secondhand and going in and directing those episodes and and also simultaneously, I became this like real crazy like television consumer. I sort of went from zero to sixty in terms of that because I used to really only watch sixty minutes in basketball. That was pretty much that was pretty much it. <laughs> my television, I just, I, I, I didn't watch it. And then all of a sudden, I found myself, you know, binge watching all of The Wire and going back into The Sopranos, you know, uh, and, and then, be, you know, starting to watch Dexter, you know, and, and Breaking Bad and, 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 and all these, like, sh shows that were just about brotherhood and, and you know, and, I, and I, I was like, wow, television is good. <laughs> wow, you know, and and, uh, and so I I began this process of trying to see if there was something for me to do, and honestly, the 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 first call that I made, I remember the room that I made it in, to my representation to say, I want to be look at a TV show, which was probably like at least three or four years ago was a really, really hard call for me to make. Really? Because I started at a time when it was like the graveyard, mm -hmm. or, or there was such a dividing line, you know, in the 70s and early 80s between being a television actor and being a movie actor, you know? It was like, not, you know, rarely did those two things cross. And it was kind of like, you know, we're thrown in the towel, you know? That's, that's the way. Every every fiber of my being, as I picked up that phone, it was like, "Well, dude, you're throwing in the towel. You know, you've given up on the movie thing." And then I read these scripts, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's good. That's like so much better 
than so many of the movie scripts yeah. that I've that I've read recently, and just one after another, you know, just fantastic pilots. And I started to realize, you know, this is a bit of a cliche now, but that the, that writers, you know, really were being drawn into this world because they knew that, for one thing, they got a chance to kind of breathe a little bit in a, in a number of episodes, but also they were given more power and more uh, control and more of what they said you know, had, had weight and had value in, in the world of television because they're, they're the ones that run the show. Were you looking specifically for a drama? Or were you open to comedy, anything? I was open to comedy. I was developing two comedies uh, at HBO. And uh, I was um, looking at all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. and even you know half hours and stuff like that. The one thing I definitely was not looking at was a network television show. Really? Definitely not. So how did you end up with a network show? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was like I had that. You know, th this, this is a this is a process of you know like like kind of peeling back the layers of snobbiness yeah. that I had, right? You know, starting with television in general, then I was like, well, it's just going to be HBO or Showtime. <laughs> you know, and then it was just going to be, uh, well, you know, cable, you know, whatever, basics, okay. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, um, and then I think, I think part of it was that I, I, I started to focus on, uh, by reading things, and responding to things, and thinking a lot about uh, you know you, you have a, you know, one of the giant pieces of of television is that you have to think about where things are going to go, you know it can't just be that pilot you know with the movie, that's it, there's the movie, you know you you read it that's it, that's what's it's some version of that is going to be on on the screen with a television show you got to go, all right that's just the beginning, uh, well is is this going to how does this roll out? Is this a concept that is sustainable? You know, is there going to be a place that's got? Do, do I do I believe in the in the in the people that are involved with the show that they have ideas about where it's you know going to roll out? And I also found myself both in the things that I was watching and the things that I was reading, drawn to life and death kind of situations. I wanted something that was high stakes, you know, like high, really high stakes. And, uh, and I wanted to be the hero. I didn't want to be the bad guy. I was going to ask about that, because when you got the script for the following, had anyone been cast? No. Were you at all interested in the role of Joe? No. I mean, we talked about it, but I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do it. So I what mean, attracted you to the role of Ryan? Because he was a hero, but he was just fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind of hero. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was a mess. and. and and, uh, you know, that's, that's really what I was interested in. Uh, the following is obviously known for its surprise twists and turns. I mean, I can't even count how many there are in the pilot episode. Do you know ahead of time what's happening to your character? How far in advance? And, and are you able to plan out your character arc? Or so are you just as surprised as we are? I am, I'm often just as surprised as you are. I definitely, every time I get a script, I'm excited to see where it's going. Uh, we... Uh, Kevin Williamson, who created the show, and I have have uh, th have through this season um, had to you know develop lines of communication about uh, about that. Uh, and no, I don't always I don't always know. We talk about things. He's he, he is um, he's very very open to discussing it with me. Uh, which he wasn't always, you know. I think that it was an adjustment for him. I don't think he's used to having actors that were as, you know, pushy about that stuff as, as me. You know what I mean? I just don't think that that was something that he had ever really dealt with before. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit of, a, of, of an adjustment. And it was an adjustment for me, too, to, to, you know, be in that kind of a, a relationship with, with uh, someone who was a creator. But I also think that the show has a certain kind of fluidity, you know. I don't think that he knows every single moment because it, you know you put something out there and, and that storyline starts to take shape and it starts to work and 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 then you sort of lift that part of it up. Um, that being said, uh, you know I I I wrote a big backstory for the character based on something that he said to me. He said, "This is a guy whose life has been surrounded by death," and that was it. I, 
I took that and just, you know, created this whole backstory. Some of which, either serendipitously, I, I happened to, you know, hit on, or he actually liked and has used. So uh, it is a, it's a fluid kind of thing between us mm -hmm. in terms of that. I also, I also think that if you really think about it, and you talk about an arc, you don't need to know where things are going to play the scene that you're in. Mm -hmm. You really don't. Because, it, because I, I, we're here in this moment right now, and I'm not thinking, I don't need to know what happens as I walk out of here. You know what I mean? That's not important to this moment. What's important is what happened back there when we first met and, you know, when we were pulling up and all that kind of stuff. That's the stuff that, that makes sense. So those are the things that you really need to focus on. Uh, sometimes it's a surprise when I see something in flashback that I hadn't oh. really thought of. Yeah. Then I go, oh, oh shit, if I'd known that. But that's the thing that surprises me. Not, not, that's the thing that I'm... I'm, I'm uh, sometimes throws me off is to see things that I didn't know about. Is there anything you would have played differently had you known? You know, honestly, uh, it's, such, it's such a whirlwind, man, to do these 15 episodes and the, the amount of pages that we do. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think, that, I think that it's one of the great things about television is that, uh, you know, with a movie, you get it, you at least have some time to kind of prepare and to think about it. And, and the performance that you, that you do is, whether or not it gets cut out or not, it is contained in this, you know, in this two hour kind of thing, you know? And man, with the, with the, with the television thing, it's just all gotta be instinct yeah. because, you know, it comes in so fast and there's so many pages and you don't have time to, to you know, what you have to do is you have to really figure out who your guy is and, or woman is and, and really, really, like really get clear about that to the point where if they throw something at you at the last minute, you can say, well, here's the thing. This is what I would do. This is what Ryan would do. I can just walk in those shoes because I know those shoes so well. Along those lines, is it a hard character to shake at the end of the day? Because he goes through so much turmoil from yes, week to week. It is. It is. Uh, I, I, it's a, a very, it's a very dark place to go. I don't think that I. I mean, I've, I've certainly have felt that with other dark films that I've done, but they, but they, they don't last as long, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, yeah, it is. It's a dark. It's a dark. It's a dark place to go. Um, and you spend. The good news is that you spend a lot of your day acting. I mean, I started thinking about how, when I, you know, when you, in in a year of doing movies, you know, there's a lot of like waiting around and then waiting for them to edit it and then promoting it and traveling to this place or whatever, or talking about it. But the amount of time that you actually act, you know, yeah. the time between action and cut, and that's all we want to do, right? I mean, we just want to act. We just want to have that, you know, we don't want to do anything, present company excluded. Uh, other, other than just act, you know, just say lines and hit marks and, and, and feel things and say things and look at your actors, you know what I mean? That, and, and, and on, on, on the series, wow, we do some acting, man. I mean, just like, yeah. you know, 16 hours, and you turn around, it's like 10 pages are just done. And you, uh, like, really, one scene after another. And that's exhilarating, but it also, in our case, uh, so much of that day is somebody is in jeopardy, uh, I'm drunk, I'm killing someone, someone's trying to kill me, you know, uh, you know what I mean? It's like a lot of, like, it's a lot of blood and gore all over the floor. So it is a, it is a dark place to go. I joked about it earlier, but can you tell us at all what's in store for your character for the next season? Oh, next season. Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, I... I, th I think that our, our discussions have all only been sort of philosophical, but I think that we're going to be at a place where we can kind of start fresh. And I think it's going to be a really interesting thing because, uh, um, you know, he's been such a tortured guy. And uh, 
maybe we can sort of see another side of, of him. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that the one thing I've begged and asked, you know, Kevin time and time again is just, is just whatever happens, because you know, our, 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 our show is, is serialized, so it's very, it's, it's very plot, you know, uh, it, I'm gonna say plot heavy, but it, but it's it, plot is very important. You yeah. got a lot of balls in the air and a lot of characters and a lot of stories that you have to juggle. I always want him to go go back and look at an episode and say, have we learned anything new? A about this character. I don't give a shit about him. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's not really true. <laughs> or, or B. Uh, have I gotten a chance to show another color to him that the audience hasn't gotten a chance to see, you know? And I'll, I'll never forget, I mean, we had a, uh, an episode, you know, and I've been, you know, really kind of tortured and, and, and you know, whatever, just stressed and beaten up and, and drinking and the whole thing. And then uh, all of a sudden, he put me in this house, in this chair, and I was a complete wise ass. My hands were tied. There was nothing physical that I could do uh, it, it, for you know probably two acts of the show because I'm basically tied to a chair. And the whole show became him just being this kind of fearless, wise ass punk. Yeah. And I was like, that's so great because I, I haven't done that for you know five episodes or something like that. It was it was a lot of fun. I can't wait to see what happens next week. Um, I want to take some questions from the audience, um, and we have a lot of people from around the world. Um, forgive me in advance if I butcher anyone's name. Um, I think it's Silky from Germany wants to know if there's a particular role that got away, a role you really wanted but wasn't cast in. Oh, man. So many. <laughs> I mean, so many. And, and I kind of... Uh, I'm trying to think of one specific. You know, the crazy thing about it is, is that there's been so many roles, and there still are. Uh, you know, just so we're absolutely clear about that, I still read things, and you know, they'll say, "Yeah, you're a, uh, you're right up there with the top, you know, right at the top of uh, the list," and I'm like, "Right? Well, you're near the top." <laughs> You're in the lower third. Uh, you know. And then, you know, I don't get it, yeah. you know? And so that still happens. But my theory is once it's over, I really don't hold on to it. I really don't. I keep looking down the road. I don't look in the rearview mirror. So I don't, you know, I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, Marina from Rio de Janeiro wants to know, what's the difference between acting on a movie and TV show? Is there a difference? Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that the, I, I don't, well, I think that the preparation should be exactly the same, you know? I think that you should, you know, take your work as seriously as you possibly can and, and commit to it and do your homework and, 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 and do whatever that is, that whatever that process is that you need to do to, to go in and do your work. Um, but you have to be ready for the fast, fact that it's fast and it's furious and there has to be a lot of instinct about what you're going to do. And it's not, it's not a place, I don't think the movie set necessarily is a place to discover the character. Some people look at it that way. I look at it, you figure out your character and then you come in and you do it. That's kind of the, the Eastwood sort of style, which is a little bit more of my, my, my way of approaching it. But a television series definitely is get ready to go. And yeah. one take, two take, especially on our show. And I'm like, we do two takes, and, I'm, and the director's like, we're going to go again. I'm like, can you tell me why? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a really good reason why we're shooting this again? Because we got a lot of work today. Buddy. <laughs> you know? And, and I, you know, so that would be the biggest difference, I think, just speed and, and instinct. Uh, Victor wants to know, if you weren't an actor, what else do you think you would have done? Well, I play music. I, I write songs. And I, I, I suppose that uh, probably... I would have, you know, done that. Um, I also like uh, architecture and, and design and, and furniture and interior design and, and structure and stuff. So maybe that. But you know, I it was a pretty. I was pretty young when I said this is the thing, and uh, I'm not. I'm not in 
part way, I'm in all the way. There were never moments where you thought of quitting? No. Uh, question from Napoleon Tavale, if I pronounce that right. Um, who and or what has been your inspiration? Who do you look up to and admire both in your personal life and in the business? Well, uh, I suppose, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, um, and I, I had this kind of moment where I shifted from, you know, as I mentioned before, fame and money and girls, uh, <laughs> to, oh, you know, acting is like a serious thing that you can actually learn and study and, and get good at. And I had this friend uh, whose name was Michael that I met. We were only friends for a really short amount of time. I think I was probably a, uh, like a junior or a senior. Maybe I was a senior in high school. And he had transferred to the school, and he, he was wealthy, and he had this uh, uh, I had VCR. And I, th I think it was a VCR, but it was some kind of a tape machine that nobody had. I mean, nobody had a home tape machine at all. <laughs> and on, on it, he had somehow had collected the movies of James Dean and, and Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. And I really didn't care about movies that much. And I started to watch them, and I went, boy, these guys are just unbelievable. And, and, and that was the first sort of glimpse into what an Amer like a real America, like my idea about American actors. And, and then I, I went to the Dollar uh, um, movie theater, and I saw Midnight Cowboy. And, and I could not believe that that wasn't a homeless guy that they had just found. <laughs> And a cowboy, and just a cowboy. I mean, if anybody hasn't seen it, you should see that movie. I mean, I, I, I was like, that's like that's acting, man. That's like that, that's like a, a uh, uh, it's different than than uh, stardom. It's it's uh, being, you know, transformational, transcendental, to step into you know a really really into another person's shoes. So so that kind of acting, you know, um, from Dustin. And, De Niro, and, and I would say uh, number one in, in that uh, in that list would be Meryl Streep mm -hmm. to me, um, because I. Yeah. She's not here. She's not going to watch this. You don't know I, she's that. She's had plenty of applause, believe me. <laughs> but you know, Meryl. I mean, it's, it's just it's like it's not it's not. Uh, it's like a di it's like a different person, man. You're just like, well, wow. I mean, that's just that's not that person is not that other person that I just saw. You know. Will you admire someone like that so much? Is it hard to terrorize them in the River Wild? <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, uh, the thing is, is that you, when you get a chance to uh, be in the same room or be in the same scene or or rub shoulders with people that are that sort of iconic to you. Um, yeah, that's that's a little bit of a challenge, but but generally, what I've found, uh, I can't. I, mean, I can't. Honestly, I don't know if I can think of an asshole that I've worked with. You know, um, you know, I, generally people and Meryl being probably the number one in terms of this. You walk in, she rolls up her sleeves, you sit down, and you start working. Wow. You know, and it's like, the, like within a couple of minutes, it's like, well, we're all. We're in the same movie, and the, you know the thing is, is also that that you know the people like her that come from the stage really had the idea that you need to play the play. You don't just play your moment. The, the worst thing that that film and television actors the trap that they fall into is that they they only play their close up. You know mm -hmm. that's the thing. You know, if, you know the rest of it's all bullshit until you get to you know, and then they and they don't even want to have any. Buddy standing there and playing the scene with them, or you know, just put an X on the my box. That's fine. I'll, you know, <laughs> it's like I, 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 I find it so. You know, with stage actors understand that that we're all in service of the story, and the story is only as good as all the parts of it. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to all be in the same scene together, and you have to be listening to the people that you're with. Speaking of, we have um, actually quite a few questions wanting to know when the last time you were on stage was and if you're looking to go back soon. Well, I'm on stage all the time with the band, and in a strange sort of way, that kind of took the place of a uh, 
stage career that was very important to me and very uh, certainly you know, very influential and and uh, uh, and incredible training around. You know, you asked me about the soaps and 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 uh, the, the the flip side of that was that I found that my work on the stage very very important uh, in terms of getting good and, and training. The last time I was on the stage was 2012. I did a one man. No, it would be 2002, actually. I did a one-man show uh, on, on Broadway, and uh, it, was, it was great. And yeah, I'd like to go back. Um, I will see how that would fit into my life, but uh, I would like to do it. Uh, did you do eight last year? Yeah, I did yeah, eight. Yeah, the stage oh, reading. Well, yeah, I did yeah. stage reading, yeah. yeah. Um, and I have a question from Gina Evangelista. Uh, wants to know if you still feel, well, actually, do you, when was the last time you auditioned? <laughs> this morning. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. It's been, uh, it's been a long time. Wants to know if you still feel like you can give bad auditions, and what's your worst audition story? Uh, I'm sure I could give a. I'm sure I could give a very bad audition at this point because I'm, I'm <laughs> very out of practice with auditioning. Um, I think one of my worst audition stories was uh, going up. I, I loved. Uh, Studio 54. I used to g try to go to Studio 54 and get in to Studio 54 when I was not famous. I mean, I was just a you know a punk, and uh, <laughs> and I'd go by myself. Once in a while, I would go with 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 a friend uh, and dance by myself. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like a weird thing I had with it, but I loved it, and and you know. Uh, and then right as Studio 54 was about to close, they, they opened up a, uh, or they, they were going to do a, a play called Got to Go Disco. And I auditioned for the Got to Go Disco. My agent, I had an agent at the time, he called me up and he said, I know you don't do musicals, but, you know, I know you like to go discoing. And, uh, <laughs> discoing. <laughs> and this is a show about a kid who likes to go discoing. And so all you got to do is sing a disco song. So I sang Alicia Bridges' I Love the Nightlife. And, and I didn't know anything about uh, sheet music and key and any of that stuff. So I just bought the record and sang it an octave above her as I practiced, practiced it. But I think that the sheet music was in a completely different key. So I, I bought the sheet music, but the piano started, player started playing it, and I was, it was way above my range, and it was a disaster. And, I screamed. and the guy who used to be the guy that let you into Studio 54 was also one of the producers. So I felt like I was back trying to get into 54. Like a weird thing, like I was envisioning the red rope, and I fell to the ground, and I said, I shouldn't be here. This is a disaster. And so that was pretty bad. So I'm going to guess you didn't get the part? I didn't get the part, no. Oh, God. And I, I mean, the show. You're, you're familiar with the show, Gotta Go Disco? Yeah. It was a uh, massive, massive hit. Um, I, don't, I don't think it was, I think it closed, like, after a day or two. So it looks like things worked out. It, yeah. Well. well, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Congratulations on a really amazing career. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Yeah.